Okay, we're going to proceed directly into our next session, which is going to be moderated by Laura Jakes, diplomatic correspondent of the New York Times. And we're going to talk about democracy and authoritarianism and the global struggle. And we're very lucky to have just the right people to, uh, to talk about this. In 2020, uh, Freedom House noted that for 15 consecutive years, there's been a decline in global freedom. And we're very unfortunate, very fortunate today to have Mike Abramowitz, the president of Freedom House, with us. Uh, before that, which he joined Freedom House in 2017, he was national editor for the Washington Post. Hassan Anduma, uh, who's a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, was previously a columnist, or is it a columnist, for the Wall Street Journal. And John Frank is Vice President for UN Affairs at Microsoft. So, Lara, over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for being here, everybody. Um, I'm so honored to be a part of this panel today. Um, you know, I wonder if it's fair to say that democracy is being challenged today in a way that has never been before. Uh, as we just heard, civil liberties and open governance eroded over the last year to a point where fewer than 20% of the world's population now live in a free and open country, according to Mike's group, the Freedom House. We're seeing strong men in China, Russia, Venezuela, Hungary, and elsewhere clamp down on their citizens, uh, and they're reaching across borders to silence political opponents, even over their own territory. In places like Myanmar and now Sudan, we've seen militaries push out civilian-led governments, and even American allies are struggling with keeping democracy intact. We saw some fairly brutal uh, street protests in Colombia earlier this year. Um, of course, you know we've seen ever-growing restrictions in India on minorities. And just this past month, we saw two governments that are friendly to the United States Ecuador, and then just yesterday in Ethiopia, imposed states of emergencies on their populaces. This, of course, gives the government's broad authority to shut down any kind of political norm or democratic norm. And of course, we Americans saw it firsthand here in January, just a few blocks from where we sit now. If you heard Chairman Schiff just about an hour ago talk about the devastating ripple effect uh, the events of January 6 had on the United States showing itself as a beacon of democracy across the world, as I, I'm quoting him here, saying that uh, our adversaries used it to show that democracy doesn't work. So why is this happening? Certainly for one, COVID hasn't helped. It's given authoritarian governments a good excuse to stop protests or elections. It's turned more people online to be confronted by sophisticated disinformation streams, as we'll hear from John. And at the same time, democracies are struggling with this seemingly contradictory goal, shutting down deep fakes and alternative facts without shutting down, at the same time, free expression. There are no easy answers, of course, to any of this, and I'm sure there's no one-size-fits-all approach that would actually work, but there's also room for hope. As the Freedom House has found, a record percentage of young adults around the world grew up in relative freedom, and they believe that self-expression is a basic right. And even in authoritarian states, people expect accountable leadership, according to a recent essay by former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. Taiwan's president recently wrote about how democracy in her government and among its people is being tested regularly by China. So far, it has been affirmed. And it just made me think, by its very nature, democracy anywhere is constantly being tested in every protest and every piece of journalism that's uh, tough but fair and honest and in every election that's free of meddling or corruption. So let's jump right in with what I hope will be a very robust conversation um, without a whole lot of uh, structure. Um, I invite all of our distinguished panelists and even audience members when we get to your questions to jump on in and uh, raise your concerns or questions. But Mike, where do you see the major stress points emerging for democracy this year? We, we heard about last year's Freedom House report where do we see it emerging this year? And has that backsliding that your organization described stopped or been even reversed? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, let me first of all start on a slight note of optimism. I'm generally kind of 
not happy with the way things are going for all the reasons you laid out. But I do think two points that I would just make before giving the customary uh, grimness. Number one is this is a supply problem, not a demand problem. And by that, I mean I have been really struck over the last several years of running Freedom House of how the demand for democracy and freedom is still very strong. And I think about the protests uh, several summers ago in Hong Kong where three million people came out onto the streets and really were demanding their rights before they were extinguished by the Chinese government. I think about the weekly protest in Belarus. Uh, I think about Sudan, too, where there was just a coup uh, several weeks ago, and, and people are still out on the streets protesting. So there's a demand for democracy. It's not a supply problem. And I've also been thinking about the Pandora Papers, which came out uh, a, few, uh, you know, a few weeks ago. The Achilles heel for the authoritarian countries is corruption. And that, the, that incredible journalistic enterprise exposed corruption on a massive scale. And I think it's going to come back and, and hurt some of the governments we're talking about. But at this point, as we end 2021, I am not sanguine that we're going to see a reversal of the trend. You mentioned uh, the coups in uh, Sudan and uh, Myanmar. I would also throw in there uh, Tunisia. Remember, these are three countries that were uh, really seen up until relatively recently as liberalizing countries. Especially Tun Tunisia. Tunisia was the only country rated by Freedom House as free in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. And so, and then you've also got four countries in particular, I'm thinking of Russia, China, Belarus, and Cuba, that have really rather ruthlessly put down uh, protests. And, and, you know, Cuba in the last couple of months has really uh, crack down on the really amazing protests, protesters who came out into the streets over the summer. So it's kind of a grim picture. Mm -hmm. And the three of those four um, states that you just mentioned, there's obviously a connection, Russia, Belarus, Cuba, right? I mean, there's a lot of exporting of some of these authoritarian values from Russia, Mother Russia, one might say, to some of these states. Right. I do think that what you're I think a lot of these uh, authoritarian countries are coming to each other's defense. You saw that in Syria with uh, uh, Russia really propping up Assad over the last 10 years. You see it in Venezuela where China and Russia are playing a major role in propping up uh, uh, the Maduro government there. So there's definitely a global <laughs> teamwork going on mm -hmm. with, uh, uh, with the authoritarian countries. And, and, the, and I would just say one thing I'm really concerned about, we can get more into this, but they are increasingly brazen about targeting people in the diaspora, their, their dissidents in the diaspora. I think some of you may have seen, there was a story in the Times a, a, a few months ago about an Iranian-American woman who was basically the Iranian government. She's American, and the Iranian government was trying to trick her to come back to uh, Iran, and, and several Iranian agents here in the United States were, were arrested for that. But I think <laughs> we are not safe even in democracies, I, I'm sad to say. So in that case, uh, the rule of law worked, right? The United States was able to protect her from the harassment, from being uh, brought back to Iran, uh, where she clearly would have been jailed, oppressed, hurt very badly, killed. Um, Probably killed. Right. They, they, did, they did that to the guy who ran Telegram in, in Iran, and he was basically tricked back and then executed. Right. But we're seeing, I mean, awful, but we're seeing um, so many a defense of authoritarianism as China does, as, you know, we are a sovereign nation. How dare you impose our values on you? Why would some of these countries allow some of this kind of cross-border repression? Why isn't that a violation of their sovereignty? What's in it for them? What do they get out of it? Are you talking about the, the countries that are where the dissidents are living? The, the democracy? Yes. I, th I think it's a big challenge to democracies. Uh, I, I think countries like... China in particular, right? We did a study at Freedom House earlier this year. We identified six countries, uh, China, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Rwanda. That's an interesting one in Africa, which have been brazenly you know, rendering uh, their dissidents back home, uh, intimidating them. They, they think to talk to any Uyghur here, here in America, and uh, the Chinese are surveilling them and, and trying to intimidate their families into ha having them shut up. I guess what I'm getting at are the host countries where these dissidents are living. Are they at all protecting these dissidents, or are they trying to stop the, these authoritarian governments 
coming in and Well, I think, the, I think the host countries are certainly aware of the problem. I think, remember, the biggest case of transnational oppression was a case of Jamal Khashoggi, where he was murdered in mm -hmm. Turkey by uh, agents of, 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 of the, the leadership there. Uh, I mean, we think the administration did, did not go far enough, but the Secretary of State did announce this so-called Khashoggi ban, which uh, was, uh, I'm not sure exactly, but you may know more about how that's being uh, played out, but that, that's, a, that's a ban on uh, certain Saudis from coming to the United States, uh, visa bans. And I think uh, the, the FBI, the Homeland Security Department, people are aware of the problem, but I think it's actually a bigger problem than, they, than, than thinking, it, and we think that more should be done to protect mm -hmm. people here. Well, we haven't seen MBS in the United States yet. So that's since true. The Chico 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 I, and I think, that's not a, I think that's not a coincidence. Right, exactly. Uh, John, when we talk about harassment of dissident groups, how much of this is being done online? And to what extent are tech companies trying to stop this from happening? Or is this more of a, a duty that a multilateral organization such as the UN needs to be stepping in and trying to set some kind of uh, you know, international law that would prevent this from happening? Well, I, I, clearly the answer is both. Um, you know, companies need to take responsibility for the businesses they run, not just how they aspire their products and services to be used, but how they're actually being used uh, in the real world. Um, we certainly do human rights impact assessments and analyses of our business, where, we, where we're willing to do business, under what terms, um, and, you know, dealing with government orders to produce information uh, is something that we look at very, very closely. And, and we're not, you know, for example, we're not willing to have customer data uh, for certain countries because we don't want to have any obligation to provide that to government and essentially be party to their suppression. Um, there was, I think in 2007, um, Tom Lantos, when he was chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, um, had held a hearing and he had Jerry Yang, the founder and CEO of Yahoo. And it was, it was a discussion about Yahoo's providing information to the Chinese government about a journalist, um, Shi Tao. Um, and you know, it, it, the hometown congressman uh, in a congressional hearing says, Jerry Yang, you're a financial and technical master, but when it comes to ethics, you're a moral pygmy. Um, and you know, it was a pretty strong statement from your hometown congressman when you bring your CEO to town. Um, and you know, I think that res you know, we listened to that really carefully. And ever since then, you know, we've we've especially been very focused on this this set of issues. So. Um, Technology companies have special responsibilities to operate their, their businesses, uh, not just how they aspire them to be used, but how they're actually used in the real world. Mm -hmm. and, and if they can't do that, you know, there's some countries, you know, we just announced LinkedIn CEO decided that he didn't feel comfortable continuing to do business in China under increasingly changing rules in China. Uh, and, and I think Yahoo also just withdrew from China in the last few days. So I, th I think that companies do try to do this, um, but we also try to remain in places where we can be a positive impact. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging set of issues. Um, the UN just had uh, the 75th anniversary completed uh, and Secretary General Guterres uh, was responsible for a report looking forward 25 years on the common agenda. But his number three issue in the executive summary was disinformation and, and sort of saying that governments need to embrace knowledge, facts, and science, and we need tech companies to be regulated in a new global compact. Um, and I think that's, that's really important. I, the third piece I would add, though, is we need to develop international law about you know, respecting international borders and sovereignty of countries when it comes to information security, cybersecurity, et cetera, um, and, and around these principles of you know, when it's appropriate to, to seek individuals' data. Mm 
Yeah, I mean, it strikes me, not all government regulations across the world would be created equal, right? And so if we're talking about some kind of level of government regulation, that opens all sorts of problems depending on what government you might be dealing with. And on the other hand, you know, there's a fair question about whether big tech should be responsible for moderating or winnowing out or managing content, um, given the, the broad power it has to, to shape political discourse. Well, Mike and I worked together on this a transatlantic working group on content moderation and freedom of expression online. And uh, Michael Chertoff was co-chair. And, and some of us thought we were there to try to deal with some of the problems of disinformation. Others thought we were there to protect, make sure that the tech companies didn't do anything to uh, reduce expression. Uh, and it's, it's a real, uh, you know, there's, there's definitely um, different parts of it. Um, and it, it's sort of like, and my conclusion from that is it is, you know, we, we do have an obligation like on Xbox, you know, we want to be able, it should be a place where kids and teenagers can, can play games without, you know, certain dangerous practices happening. Mm -hmm. They may be lawful speech, but it's still harmful speech. And it's not what you want in the audience. You got to be able to moderate that. Um, but at the same time, if you're going to be dealing with more sensitive discourse, you need to really be thoughtful about how you're going to, to do that um, and set up the appropriate appeal procedures, review procedures, and do it in a timely way and things. Um, so I think that you know, it's a difficult set of things. Uh, from a government point of view, though, regulating content is really, really hard. Regulating business practices around an advertising business model that promotes engagement for the sake of advertising, that's something that's easier to regulate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't help but be a reporter at this moment and just ask you bluntly, at what point might we expect some kind of resolution on this, especially in an era where technology keeps evolving? I mean, is this going to be the self-licking ice cream cone that is always a problem that we are never going to be able to resolve, that we're going to keep kind of chasing our tail in coming up with a solution? It's pretty disappointing how slow governments have been to kind of address some of the problems. Mm -hmm. um, and the United States, I think, is kind of losing its leadership position as a regulator of US industry because of the inaction. Uh, and you know, we're seeing uh, you know, really interesting proposals all around the world now on how to regulate technology. Uh, the Australia, earlier this year, came with proposals around how do you protect news uh, in an online environment. Um, you know, the, the British uh, post-Brexit have been anxious to regulate you know, in their own style, and so they, they have a duty of care piece of legislation moving forward. Um, and we were gonna see lots of different experiments because there is a broad set of concerns out there that technology and the internet are harming democracy and breaking down the social cohesion that's necessary for societies to function well together. You mentioned Australia. I'm going to use that as a fairly awkward pivot to talk about the Quad. Um, Sedanand, I'm sorry, I'm nervous today. Um, President Biden has been trying to pull India away from China with the help of the other Quad members, but how can he credibly enlist India as a democratic ally when Prime Minister Modi and his party, as you have written, are eroding India's uh, democratic and human rights. Thanks for that question, Lara. Uh, I'll answer that, but before that, I sort of, I think I want to start by saying something, which is that if we'd been having this conversation, say, 10 years ago, I wouldn't be on this stage as someone who writes primarily about India, because India was not part of the set of problems in the democratic world. It was, in fact, seen as a great outlier in the post-colonial world as having maintained uh, liberal democracy at a very low level of per capita income. Now you find that Freedom House says that India rates India as partly free. The Sweden's variety of, of democracy says that India is uh, no, no longer, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an electoral autocracy. It is no longer classified as a democracy by, v, by, by VDEM. And I think that what it comes down to, and here I sort of disagree with Mike a little bit, is that I don't think we have, only, uh, we have only a supply problem and not a demand problem. We have 
both a supply problem and a demand problem when it comes to liberal democracy. There are people around the world who are attracted to the idea of choosing their leaders, but it is much harder, particularly in the developing world, to, set, to sell a set of ideas that we associate with democracy, say, in the United States. And by that, I mean things like equality before the law. Mm -hmm. By that, I mean things like independent institutions that are, in fact, designed to check the power of very popular leaders. And that is what you have happening in India. If I talk, when I talk to Indians, or when I say, when I write an article, say, in the Wall Street Journal, and I say that India is suffering from democratic backsliding, the vast majority of people who respond to me say, what are you smoking? We had an election in 2019 and more than 600 million people voted. Are you trying to tell us that we have a problem with democracy? And I have to step back and say that, well, yes, it's very true that India is an extremely robust, is extremely robust in terms of people going out to vote and often and changing governments, but it is suffering on th other dimensions of democracy minority rights, freedom of the press, and independent judiciary. And many of those ideas, right, the liberal part of liberal democracy, those are in fact not as easy to sell. And they're not as easy to sell, coming back to your point about technology, uh, those of you who've been following the Wall Street Journal and other newspapers, there's been a lot of coverage about how India is really ground zero in many ways for Facebook's problems. And that is because you have a ruling party and a ruling movement in India that wins elections in part by mobilizing members of the majority Hindu community against members of the minority Muslim community. When you step in and try to say that you're going to come up with either regulation at the company level or regulation at the United Nations level, you are directly challenging their interests. They have no interest in that. That would hurt them. So I think that sort of, so, so when, you, when you sort of look at this from the perspective of a country like India, it's just much more complicated. It is much simpler if we look at it in the sort of traditional way that we were used to looking at it in the Cold, in the Cold War, which is that, well, here are people who aren't allowed to vote, and they want to vote, and that's the solution. What you have in many places, not just India is probably is the largest example, and it matters because it's 18% of the world's population. But you could have a similar conversation about many, many other places. Uh, Hungary is a, sort of another sort of, you know, uh, is, is one that's discussed very often. People want elections. People don't necessarily want the other stuff that goes along with it. Now, to come to your point about the Quad, I think it really, it, it comes down to whether the U.S. thinks it's in its interest to basically look away from the erosion of liberal democracy in India in the interests of countering China. And the Modi government, in my view, has made that calculation. They have figured that when push comes to shove, the Biden administration would rather have a country with 1.3 billion people, a long contested border with China, one of the largest militaries in the world, and until recently a fairly fast growing economy, on its side as this new Cold War develops with China? Would you rather have India in the room on the same side as the US and Japan and Australia or not? And I think that the Indian calculation on this is that that's what the people who really matter are going to come down on. That's, that's the side they're going to come down on in the end. And therefore, they can get away with some of this other stuff. Uh, I think it's an unfortunate cynicism that governs the world we live in. But I think that unfortunate cynicism uh, describes reality. So I have two quick follow-ups, and unfortunately time is tight, so uh, f um, I'll keep my question short, and maybe you guys can keep your answers short, and we'll try and open it up for one question if we have time. Um, what you were describing about this, this choice of, of India, it made me think about the foreign minister who said, you know, you, this is not a choice between democracy and authoritarianism. Like, that's how people want to paint it, right? And so it, it makes me wonder if the U.S. and other liberal democracies have unrealistic expectations for other countries to live up to the standard of a liberal democracy, as, as I think he was flagging and I think as you just described. And then, Mike, to kind of pivot quickly to that, what are the risks 
for the United States and other liberal democracies to look away as you know, we are hearing they're doing perhaps in India? So let me, let me answer very quickly. I, so I'm a partisan in this debate. I believe in liberal democracy. I believe in the underlying liberal values that make liberal democracy possible. And I think that it's in the interest of the United States over the long term to support those values across the world. My point is very simply that it is more complicated and it is much more difficult to do that in an era where we have countries that are democratic in some respects and not democratic in other respects. And that's quite different from an, an earlier generation which was fighting these battles in the era of communism where it was much more straightforward. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Well, First of all, I would associate myself uh, with the comments just made that you know, we firmly believe that in the long term, liberal democracy is, is the only answer. But in the short term, it's going to necess necessarily require you know, accommodations and trade-offs. I'm going to be, from Freedom Mass, we're always going to be pushing for values-based foreign policy. We think that's in the long-term interest of the United States. And we do not want to be surrounded by a lot of countries, as Madeleine Albright once said, that don't share our values and that are authoritarian. But in the short term, you know, we're going to have to make uncomfortable trade-offs. And the, the one that was outlined uh, about India is, is just a perfect example of that. Yeah, I remember very vividly being in Iraq in 2010 covering elections. And uh, the aftermath was fairly messy in trying to set up a, a parliament. And somebody at the US Embassy said, well, this isn't Jeffersonian democracy. I mean, it's as, democracy is as good as it gets. And so uh, it, that line always stuck with me. And it makes me think about developing democracies and democ democratic backsliding and whether uh, the expectation of a Jeffersonian democracy is something that all countries can meet. Right. Well, and the one thing I would say, is certainly at Freedom House, we don't believe that you can impose democracy either by force or by, I mean, it's up to the, the people of each country uh, to, to, to choose their own path and, and, and we can all be supportive of that. But in the end, it's up to, you know, the Belarusian people or the people of Myanmar or the people of Sudan. Uh, you know, we can, we can try to be supportive, but in the end, it's, it's, it's not our, we can't impose it. John, I see you're about to say something. Yeah, I just, I want to, the, in the European Union, it's very troubling that um, you mentioned Hungary, but also Poland um, are moving towards less liberal democracy. And I think sometimes in the last administration, the U.S. was part of the problem in trying to peel them off a little bit on politically from, from the EU consensus on things. And I do think it's, you know, it's really disturbing that you know, these, these significant countries in the European Union are not moving towards the European consensus around liberal democracy. And I think that the United States needs to be supporting the European Commission and its efforts uh, as a very important step. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Any of the emerging leaders in particular? Anyone? There. Someone over there. There's one question there. Oh, I see. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for being here. My name is Isha Dalal, and you spoke a little bit about how big tech is eroding the social capital that is fundamental to democracy. Earlier today, multiple speakers cited foreign powers pushing disinformation into American society. For example, Russia has been cited as a power that exacerbates existing divides in American society. For example, we've seen Russia exhibit great success in their vaccine disinformation campaigns. Can you discuss what regulations or laws may be effective in combating this, especially for such a multifaceted issue? Should we be looking at things like Section 230, or should we be looking at other um, regulations or international law as a way to combat this? Thank you. John, you want to start? Sure. I, um, I think we need to develop more international law on this. Um, I think we talked about before in the US, sometimes we compartmentalize these things, cybercrime, cybersecurity, uh, disinformation. You know, the Russian information security doctrine includes all of that. And, and they frame the way they approach these issues, those as one. Um, there, we believe that international law does apply. Um, there's a project that we're sponsoring with the Japanese government at Oxford University uh, we call the Oxford Process. And it's, it's a process of getting some international law academics together to develop short consensus papers around what international legal principles apply to, for example, disinformation. Because there is a, you know, a violation of sovereignty um, and there does need to be human rights concerns factored in when, when countries engage in these activities. Public diplomacy is great, but disinformation operations are a problem. And so I think that 
where we see the opportunity right now is building more consensus and elaborating what international law does. And so the Oxford process is, is where we think um, it's really important to move, as well as the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace, a, a French-led effort, um, which we're hoping the United States will join um, sometime soon. I see I'm getting the high sign, unfortunately, but Sadanan or, or Mike, would you like to follow up very quickly on that? Well, just one very quick point I would make. Embedded in your question is, I think, something important to remember. We are very, we can be very critical and should be very critical of big tech for failing to police, you know, disinformation or misinformation. Although I would just say that's kind of harder to uh, uh, define in the specifics than in the abstract. But I do think we have to remind ourselves that governments are driving a lot of the bad things that are happening in terms of violations of human rights. Think about what happened to Apple and Google in Russia where the Russian government, it was the Russian government that basically forced them to, uh, and they acquiesced, unfortunately, to take down this voter information app that was uh, 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 disagreeable to the Russian government. And so, and we, at Freedom House, we see that happening all over the world, where governments are in the guise of combating fake news or, or, or policing disinformation are really implementing very serious affronts to human rights. Just add one sentence, and I'd say that I, I, in some ways, I, I, I don't fully agree with the premise of the question because I don't think this can be top down. What we don't understand or we don't fully sort of internalize is the idea that a lot of fake news, for example, is deeply popular. A lot of fake news has legs because it appeals to people's prejudices. And for us to try and deal with this from up high, I think it's very, very difficult. It's like trying to bail out an ocean with a thimble. And there has to be a very strong bottom-up element uh, in, 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 in tackling this. And I don't think an, a top-down approach based on international law alone uh, will be able to solve this problem. A democratic response, one might say. That's from the exactly. Grassroots. All right, thank you all. I'm sorry we didn't get to more questions, but uh, here's to my amazing panel.